Oh my god. Uh, let's record my beautiful face. That's all we're doing. We're just recording my beautiful face. We're not doing anything else. Hello, fellow adventurers, and welcome back to Dungeons & Dragons Tabletop Edition. I'm your host, your companion, your narrator, and Dia. Yeti. From Yeti Studios, if you didn't, weren't aware. Anyway, so prior to this, I did do the original story of Ragdar Frost for you, and if you haven't seen it, there's going to be a card thing up here and a link down below. I don't even know if my fingers are... No, no actually, no, my finger was right. I had to look at my recording screen. Big nostrils. Oh boy, I have had a very good day today, so I'm going to be a little bit goofy. But I'm going to try and keep it a little serious, because this is a role-playing game, and I need to be a bit serious. But I also am a DM, so I can decide what the hell I think about my world, so... Hmm. We're going to retain the world that I was using previously with Ragnar. If you haven't seen the story, go check it out. It's only like five minutes long, so it's a quick, you know, quick poop and done. Cinematically edited, it's got some um, video graphics, visual graphics used through Dungeons & Dragons Online to add a little bit of flair and, you know, kind of get an image of the story. But uh, I decided I'd try a different method. We're about to start a new tale. We're going to be starting back in Umbria, which is the world where Ragdar was from. And we're actually going to pick up with his story. I'm using the Mythic GM emulator, but I also found an app that I hope will help me. I haven't made the characters themselves. I know who the characters are, I just haven't... Oh, shit. Crap. Yes, I have, like, a laptop. I can't see my thing. I have... No, it's my belly. We don't want to look at that. Well, we, I mean, you might, but we're not going to look at my... I have a laptop over here. I have one screen here, one screen here, and I've got my main tower here. So I've got a whole bunch of technology all around me, even though I'm playing a game about fantasy. So, just bear with me. As you don't, as you may or may not know, Ragdar left his home seeking out a relic to retain, to basically become an exile. He was exiled for a crime he may or may not have committed. But you won't know until you watch that video. So watch that video. Make sure to watch that video. Seriously, I'm going to put it up there again. It's in the description. So watch it. His cousin, Bor Bormir, kind of like Bormir, it randomly generated and I liked it, so I picked it. Bormir Finerock is a Dwarven fighter. So we're going to make Bormir first. Might just have to change the name because it's going to be difficult not to fucking sound like I'm playing Lord of the Rings. Which we're not going to be playing Lord of the Rings because I do not need to be sued. I don't think that uh, Tolkien would have that much. I can't remember the first name of Tolkien's name. But I don't think Col Tolkien would be that kind of person to sue me just because I happen to pick a name that happened to be just like one of their characters. But I don't know. And we're not going to play that game. It's a dwarf, okay? So it's racially incorrect. Or not racially incorrect, it's racially different. Yeah. Leave me alone. Um, his name is Bormir Feinrock. He's a dwarven fighter who is the cousin of Ragnar. The reason why Bor Bormir has left his mountainous home is because of the fact that He's curious as to where the hell his cousin disappeared to. He returns home, and he's wondering where did where did where Ragnar go? What happened? Why has he been exiled? I need to find him. He's out there and he's alone. I need to go find my cousin. Okay, we have our first thread, which if you don't know, a thread is like a, a storyline to the, the whole overall thing. We now have an idea of what Boromir's doing. But first, we got to figure out Boromir's stats. Five, six, seven, eight. So we have an eight. We have E out of a 3D6. I'm using the 3D6 system, but I'm going to choose where I put them. Because if I was to do it the normal way, or well, one other method where it's, you do a strength, you do everything once in a row, he'd be a really crappy fighter. Unless he's like a dex fighter. 12. Okay, we're not looking too shabby, but we're not looking too great either. I'm doing a 3.5 slash 5E kind of mix. The heavier you're on the... Uh, Heavier on the 3.5, I'm not taking a 7, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, 10 I can play with. Uh, -doo -doo -doo, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oh dear, my good friend Bormir, you may need these, you may need your assistances. You may need those extra characters because you are not looking too hardy, my friend. Yeah, oof. Got an 8, 12, 10, 9, 13, 11. That's eef. It's gonna be tough. But again, the dice gods are, you know, they're fickle. They're fickle, fickle beings that don't want to be nice to you all the time. I'm not answering phone calls. I'm busy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got two low numbers. It's all really. Alright, um. <sighs> Boromir. What do we want to do with you? You don't have any really high stats. Where am I gonna put them? 
Well, you know what? Since we're doing random generation and whatnot, we're going to do a 1 through 6. 1 being strength, 6 being charisma, and everything else falling in between. And we're going to go down the list. So we're going to start with 8. We're going to see where 8's going to land. Where's going to... Yep. It landed on a 1. Is my die pretty? I have, like, tons and tons of dies. Just, just so many different dies. Just, like, I got, like, dies up the balls. I even have like three other bags somewhere, but I don't know where I put them. I have too many dice, and these are this is the, this is the box that my aunt actually gave me to put my dice in, and most of my dice are actually from my dad. Um, I haven't actually talked about this. I don't think I've talked about it on Twitter or any results, but um, I originally became a part of the D and D culture world thing through my dad years ago. He had the original uh, first edition Red Box and all that other fun stuff along with some other like two I think it was advanced it was advanced D&D &D books as well um and I got interested in it and then we played a lot and we played with my uncle Chet for well a lot and especially when I got older we played some more because he was living near us unfortunately he moved away and then we stopped playing and I was playing with my friends I've been playing D&D &D pretty much my entire life and my dad is also has a game starting with my uncle Chet again so we're gonna play at least once a month, and it would be, correct. it would be a lot of fun to uh, do that. But yeah, I really do enjoy D and D, and I've read the books more times than I can count. Back to the number rolls. All right, we're gonna go for decks. We're, or, yeah, we're going. We're gonna continue to do that. If it rolls up as a one. We're just gonna drop that number. We're gonna reroll. We're looking at a twelve. Are we gonna put twelve? Are we gonna put twelve? We're gonna put twelve on thirteen. Uh, yeah, we're gonna put twelve on three, which is gonna be Constitution. So he's got a twelve Constitution. But Dwarves get a plus two to Constitution. I don't remember. I don't know what the rule is for 5e. I'm gonna use 3.5's racial rules. Yeah, because I like the I like the plus negative on that. Two. So we're looking at a 10 dexterity. Eesh. I don't know if Vormir is gonna be a fighter now because with an eight strength, that's gonna hurt. Well, a different number. All right, six. Eesh. I think I might have to reroll Vormir. I don't think he's gonna. Well, that leaves. Wait, I don't know. Oh, whoops. Okay, you know what? You know what? You know what? I'm gonna roll. I'm gonna. I'm gonna reconfigure him a little. He's gonna be a wizard. You're a wizard, Harry. You're a hairy wizard. He is a hairy wizard. Oh, that plays so weirdly into the story, though. Now that I think about it, well, I can't tell you because you gotta watch the video. But it plays so oddly into the story. I was gonna play cleric, but clerics are like fighting type. They like to fight sometimes. Hmm. Roll. You know what? Let's use the engine. We'll use the engine. We'll be like, hey, should I reroll? Should I not reroll? All right. Ask a question. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, I'm sorry, Vormir, but you're stuck with what you got. All right. So now we have Vormir. Can wizards use crossbows? I can't remember that. Is a crossbow a simple weapon? I like crossbow. All right. Well, I guess he's going to be a shooter. And he also gets a dagger. Yeah. Woo. Woo woo. We'll use 5e's skill, skill board thing, though. Because I like that one more. It's, it's a lot easier. Vormir has, like, terrible intelligence. It's just so low. I think it would be a good idea to uh, not try and use things that have saves. Yep, that's the fire bolt. Fire bolt. Fire bolt. Uh, don't need light. Burning hands is always fun. Oh, that's a first level. Uh, Jim's magic missile. Is this from... Oh, this... Yeah, I had a feeling. It was Jim dark magic. Who, if you don't know, is a character from the PAX East and West D&D &D campaign which is really freaking funny. I love it. I um, I don't remember who he's played by, but I, <laughs> ironically, the only person I remember that's actually played it with the group is Will Wheaton, and he plays uh, an Aladrin. All right, we're going to do Magic Missile. Yep, we're going to do a Tremor. That's going to be his other... I would play, damn it. Let me play! I can imagine he probably would want to stay in a distance. Ooh, that was a good one. That was a boom boom. Right, okay. All right, so we have our lovely character, Boromir Finerock, and he's looking for his cousin. He's headed to the Borderland Keep again, which is where Ragdar ended up going, because he heard that's where he ended up going. So now <laughs> it is a storm. We have a storm. It said yes. So it's an extreme. It's not even just yes. It's extreme yes. 
we have a storm. It is raining heavily. Boromir made the worst decision of his life. Which actually, since the Borderland Keeps are in the mountainous region, it's more likely a blizzard. Lovely. Boromir is in his robes. He's getting blustered. It is freezing out. He is probably cursing every god in the realm for this poor weather and trying to locate his cousin and probably questioning his own resolve, but we don't know that. We don't, I don't have that wrote down. I don't have any of his bombs or anything like that at the moment, which we're not going to worry about that right now. Right now, Boromir's goal is to find his cousin, so I think his bond would probably be along the lines of finding his cousin. His family's important to him. So that'll be one of his quirks. We'll put down that his family is important. Yes, family is important. He probably won't shake his desires to keep his family together, or at least find his family. Okay, so it is currently snowing, which means oh, it's cold. It's cold. It's very cold. All right. Uh, is anything happening? He's looking. Does he lo does he locate anything? Let's ask the question. Where am I going? What am I doing? What is going on here? Who are we? What are we doing with ourselves? The scene has been interrupted. New scene. Focus. NPC positive. Meaning, gratify a record. So it's good for an NPC. Gratify a representative. I'm not sure what gratify means, actually. I mean, I kind of have an idea of what it means, but that's kind of a... Give... Alright, so apparently, according to the dictionary, give someone pleasure or satisfaction. Ooh. Indulge or satisfy a desire. So this is definitely... Hmm. I don't know if this would be very appropriate for you two. <laughs> oh, boy. This is... This is went just downhill quickly. Because all I can think of... Alright, so here's what I'm thinking this scene's probably going to play out as. Is that Vormir ends up coming across a somebody and another somebody, and they are... It's midday. Why would they be doing it in the middle of the day? I think some pleasure satisfied. Alright, well, we're not, I guess we're not going to go that, just that way. Um, he come. That's really weird. Why would, why would there be a... If, because that was, there's a thought, is that it's a representative. Maybe it's a tax collector... Oh, maybe a lord or bandit. Maybe a bandit? So I guess, yeah, it is, it, 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 it's gratifying to a way. He's getting pleasure, in a sense, from getting money from somebody because obviously having sex in the middle of a. That's really weird. Why would they be doing. Why would he be extorting money from a traveler in the middle of a blizzard? That's just strange. Why? Or, all right, so here's the information. Here's what we got here. We have the bandit's leader is. The name of the bandit is Aiden. He's the bandit leader. That's good. He's what type of race is he? It's the keeps, borderland keeps. He's probably human. He's a, we're gonna say he's male, obviously, name wise. Um, probably has a level or two of fighter, and he's currently robbing someone. Probably abrasive, aggressive. We now know that we have a bandit leader named Aiden, whose name isn't known yet. At least by Bormir. He doesn't know this. Doesn't know his name yet. Bormir is looking for his family. He's looking for his cousin, Ragnar. And chances are, you would assume that if this traveler has been, you know, extorted by a bandit leader, maybe his cousin was. So we're going to question him. We're going to question the bandit leader. Let's see how this plays out. All right. Would his, would the bandit, we're going to find out, would the bandit leader have seen his cousin? Especially in the middle of a blizzard. And would it make any sense for him to actually approach this bandit? It's the middle of very cold, very blue. Eh, I don't know. Where are we gonna say it's a blizzard, or are we gonna say it's something else? All right. So it's it's very cold, very cold weather, very and more than likely Aiden is probably just trying to get money to you know money and whatever else he can. So the traveler's probably got maybe a, a, uh, a shipment of like food and stuff for the keep, and the bandit leader decided to waylay him to get the food for himself. Should Bormir try and stop this? So we'll ask a question. Let's see. No. <laughs> okay. I guess Boromir is not going to go and interact with this bandit leader. All right. Um, so what the hell is he going to do? All right. Well, we're going to have to reevaluate the scene because he's obviously not. Well, the bandit leader's busy with the traveler. He may not. He probably hasn't seen Boromir, especially if it's cold. He's probably focused on the traveler, making sure the traveler doesn't take off on him. Oh. All right. Well, ah, this would be interesting. So while Boromir is preparing to leave, there is a sudden attack on this NBC. Of on a on Aiden, and he's been usurped by his own crew because they're hungry. They haven't eaten. 
in several days, so his company attacks him. Uh, the question is, is what is Boromir going to do in return for that? Is he going to go and help, or is he just going to run? And now, now this this has gone kind of weird. All right, so the bandit got ambushed. The bandit leader got ambushed. Aiden got ambushed by his own team, or potentially another team. But we don't know that. And Boromir, being you know only out to look green for his cousin, decides to move on. So the bandit leader is more than likely either dead or is fighting off his opponents, and the traveler is taken off or is going to end up losing his food anyway. We don't know. Boromir had no interest now. It's too many people, and he knew he couldn't wouldn't be able to do anything for him. So that'll be the end of scene one. We're still working on the thread of Boromir locating his cousin. So he's traveled down his way some. He's heading back down the road. It's again, it's very cold, very, very frigid. Um, so it's probably a light blizzard, winds whipping, it's cold, Boromir's and he's looking again, he's looking for somewhere to probably, you know, settle out for the afternoon, you know, until it hopefully, you know, stops or even just for the night, just staying somewhere. He's got some rations, so he's not like likely to need food. Um, so, um, does he find like a, a uh, somewhere to make for a decent, a decent shelter, something like that? Let's see. Yes. Okay. Ah, actually, that'll work. We'll say well, he found an inn. I mean, the keep, the keep lands, um, Alteran, the Alteran foothills may not be, you know, most most law-abiding area, but they more than likely have an inn or two because there's probably travelers coming out of the mountains and back into the more lower lands and stuff like that. So he's kind of like in the mid-range, like the foothill area. I mean, you have the mountains where he's from, which is where also where Radgar is from. Then you have the keep, the keep area, which is kind of like a borderlands between like the harsh orc and giant-filled mountains where the dwarves also live right now. Well, some dwarves live here. There's obviously more lands, but in this particular area of Umbria, dwarves live here. And there's the keep that borders the, the mountains and the foothills, which are very, very um, lawless, usually filled with like more lesser monsters like goblinoids and orcs and things like that that tend to lurk there, along with bandits and miscreants and you know those kind of people. And but there's also going to be some inns. There's going to be some places for people to stop on the travel because travelers come by all the time. I mean, obviously that. But oops. So he ends up coming upon this tavern is we're looking at a female dwarf. Her name is Rauri. She's an innkeeper, probably will be spying on travelers. Along those lines, she's trying to ensure that her inn stays, you know, an inn and not a, a home for bandits or something like that. So that's that's probably the reason for that. And her inn is, we're gonna call it the Incompetent Giant. Okay, so we have the Incompetent Giant Tavern. And we have a dwarf innkeeper named Rauri. And it is, the inn is a small half timber building roughly hewn wooden tables and benches. Accommodations consist of several wooden cots in the cellar and several hammocks in the common room. The inn was rebuilt recently after a devastating fire. That would explain why she's wearing the magic ring. She's trying to protect, trying to make sure that the people that she lets into her inn aren't going to blow the hell, blow the place all to hell, which is a very good reason to want to have to wear a ring and keep an eye on. Is the reason why Rauri wears the ring and because the inn was burned was destroyed by a devastating fire. Is Rauri, the reason why Rauri is checking her patrons is if she's wondering if they are spellcasters and they're going to blow up her place because they're loony, because this is a very lawless land, so it's a good reason why she would be protecting. So we're going to go and ask that question. Extreme no, okay? So it is definitely not because of spellcasters. So why would she be wearing the ring? Well, perhaps that would be a good reason for, uh, well, at least now we know that Bormir can go inside. Okay, so I think I have an idea as to why she's doing this. She's young. She's divorced. So my guess would be or a dwarf who escaped a previous marriage, a deceptive, maybe illusionist-like type, which could also play into the idea that this could actually be that dastardly dwarf who affected Ragnar and made Ragnar get exiled. Which, again, if you haven't seen it, the link is up there and it's in the description, so you need to go watch it so you can understand that. Okay? Okay. All right. Good. So, now we know a little bit more about Rari. So, Boromir goes in, creaks the door open, sees the two of the half, the couple of halflings, the dwarf talking to another dwarf, the woodsmen who look like they've been wounded. They may have been attacked by the bandit leader. Who knows? And we also have a human. I think I mentioned human. If I didn't, if there's another human, there's a female halfling, and there's, another, there's a male halfling. 
So he arrives and he approaches the bar and does he notice her ring? I mean, this is a long shot. This is a very you know what we're gonna do with the we're gonna do with the we're gonna do with the generator. Very 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 long shot. Almost no way he would notice it activating because she's more likely spotted him and she's going to want to activate it to see to make sure it isn't her ex-lover if we want to consider it. Okay, no, he doesn't notice the ring. But he noticed the, the, does he know what uh, uh, a wisdom perception check? Maybe something like that. Mm. No. If she gives him a quizzical look, but he doesn't make much mind of it. Um, again, he's not he's not a great wizard. He's just a he's a he's a fledgling wizard, back then. probably more akin to a hedge wizard or something like that. He doesn't isn't fully aware of his powers yet so and plus he's not necessarily looking for you know looking to be attacked by someone per se although he does know that this land is very dangerous that's probably why he left Aiden who may or may not be alive now um, so let's have a wee bit of a chat with this Rari forgive me for any weird voices that I attempt to make because I am not a voice actor I am not a professional at least how are we gonna talk like Borg you know what I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna wait Hello there, miss. You have a rather fine establishment. I was uh, wondering, have you seen a dwarf? Orange hair, braided to the side, and probably wearing chainmail with a shield. Has he come into this re resident uh, uh, into this place at some point? Rory looks at him. Hello there. Um, no, I can't say I have. We haven't had many dwarf visitors recently. It's mainly been these folk who frequent this tavern. Unfortunately, I can't help you with that. I haven't seen anybody like that. Is there anything else I can help you with? Mm -hmm. Well, all right, so his cousin has a bank, and he has no reason to believe that she's lying to him. She doesn't seem to want to lie to him. Um, and plus, it's still pretty cold out, so it would probably be a good idea for him to take the rest here, right? Do you have any rooms available? Any words for me to rest my head? It's very cold out if you aren't aware. Oh, of course, I, I'm well aware of how cold it is outside. My, a few people have come in and said that there's a storm on the way. So, um, let me think. Yes, we do have at least one cot. It's downstairs. Uh, if you don't mind sharing cots, in a, or if you don't mind sleeping in a cot with other patrons. Mm. No, I think I'll be um, how much? I don't have a number. Uh, seeing as it's a small establishment, more than likely has to pay for a lot for for shipments. We'll say a couple copper pieces. We'll say two. D, we'll do two D four to find out what the price is for a cot. I mean, it's not exactly a room, but she needs to make her money. She wants her money. Six. Six copper pieces. It'll be six copper pieces for the cot. All right. Bormy reaches into his pouch and hands over the six copper pieces. And she takes it, slides it behind the bar. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, I think I'll retire to my cot for the night. Thank you. Now, before we let him take his leave, we need to find out if something happens. And we rolled an altar, and it's NPC negative. We have control rumor. NPC negative. Rari, her estranged husband. The man bursts through the door. Looks at Rari. Runs up to the bar. Rari. I've heard rumors. He's coming. What? No. I can't, I can't go back to him. Not after, not after the things he did. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And before Boromir is able to go down to the cellarway to find his cot, he turns around to notice this incident and approaches. What's the matter? What's going on? It's there's something wrong? If she gives him a look, and the man glances at him and branches his knife, and yanks a knife out of his belt, and he branches it to him. Who are you? Better, better tell me who you are. Rari doesn't need your shit. No, hold on, I'm not a threat. Rari shakes her head. No, no, no. My ring, it's already checked in. He's fine. He's not going to do anything to me. He isn't going to hurt me. He's not him. Sorry, friend. She's slowly puts his knife back to his belt. She's been attacked in the past by her ex-husband. He's not a very good man, and he 
he, he, he's looking for her. And he's very good at deceptions and illusion. Actually, he's a dwarf, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. Nobody knows anymore the way he changes the illusions and makes himself change all the time. Nobody knows. All right. You guys can stay here for the night. By the morning, I have to be gone. I'm going to close this place up. I'm going to have to leave again. I'm going to have to go find somewhere else to live for the time being. And Bomer looks at her. Are you sure? You really want to leave? Do you really want to leave your establishment over a man? Or for whatever he was? I don't know if I have much of a choice. I can't, I can't stay here. I, I might have to go to the keep. I may have to go home. I may... I don't know. He knows where I live. He, he knows the keep. Can I travel with you? Are you a traveler? Are you going somewhere? Well... No, I'm actually looking for my, oh, my cousin, but, but you know what? Yes, I'll take you along, at least until a town where you can feel a little safe, or at least for some time, we'll find a way to bring you back to the tavern. Okay, thank you so much. And she pulls the copper pieces back out and puts them on the table. Take your money back. You're gonna, you're, you're giving me a, you, you're helping me out greatly by doing this. So Boromir is, that's so, all right, so this is how the scenes play out. Bormir has agreed to help Rari, the innkeeper of the incompetent giant inn, escape her husband's ex-husband's clutches once more. And it's been a rumor, but it would have seemed that her choice is to escape, to leave this tavern. Unfortunately, that means the other patrons are going to have to as well. But that gives her an opportunity to get away and hopefully escape, and maybe she can even find a way to change herself. And she's obviously now revealed the power of her ring. So, that ends scene. Two. Okay. So there's our story. That has been the story for this episode. I want to thank everyone so much for joining me on this adventure. Uh, it was a bit shaky and rocky at the start, trying to learn how the system works, and I will be getting the manual. I need to get that manual it's just for referencing and information so I can understand a little bit more how to use this system. But I do enjoy, I'm enjoying the hell out of this system. And unfortunately, it, well, not so much unfortunately, but at least combat didn't occur. I don't know if the whole, how everything occurred with the bandit leader was correct. So they will be leaving in the morning. But what occurs in the morning, we won't know until, until we return with our next episode of this adventure. 